Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for uh, willing to do this. Oh, absolutely. Wow. You have a very deep voice. Do you do voiceovers? No. <laughs> oh, you should. <laughs> you sound like the voice of God. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you exactly? I'm in um, outside of Minneapolis. Hmm. Okay, cool. Well, I can just start from the uh, core kind of jump around then in terms of uh, different roles in your career. Okay. And I did read up on uh, your background and um, you're originally from California. And I know that you said that your first ever paid job in, in anything was voiceover. So what was the, what was the first uh, role? <laughs> it was uh, one of the dirty animes. Uh, it, was, it was called Bride of Darkness. Okay. And turned into a tentacled creature with, with, I don't know, can I say penises on this thing? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah, with penises on the end of my tentacles. And th that was my first one. And then my second, which followed right after that, was, um, was actually Magic Users Club, which I think you mentioned you liked. So it was, uh, yeah, I was doing a, um, a one-man show as part of college. I went to NYU and I was um, doing a one-man show as part of my program there for theater. And uh, I pl I created this show that was like the good and evil sides of myself uh, having an argument. And um, Michael Sinter Nicholas, who you probably know who he is, um, he came to the show because I, I think that's how he found some of his talent. And um, he liked the evil my evil Kevin voice and he was like oh come you know come audition so I auditioned for that and got it and then um we kind of went on from there and I've worked with him for 20 years now mm -hmm. yeah I just saw that uh you got the direct talent lesson on it too so that was cool and I just I also just talked to Michelle Marie like a couple weeks ago oh did you yeah oh I just I just worked with her yeah talentless Nana that was awesome um, that was a really fun project. Um, she was great. I mean, talk about like the good and the evil. She had, I don't know if you know the show, but she had yeah. like, you know, the side that she showed everybody and then the real, real her. It was, I won't give it away, but she was awesome to work with. Mm -hmm. So you interviewed her? Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. I've never actually seen her. I don't even know what she looks like. I, oh. I did everything <laughs> here in my office from New Jersey over yeah. the computer. So, well, so with, um, with stepping into Babaratsubo, uh, how could you personally relate to him at all? Wow, how could I personally relate to him? Well, it's been a couple of years since I've seen it, but um, I just loved his um, freedom. Do you know what I mean? Like he, he, he like felt like he could just say anything at any time. Uh, mm. And it was totally okay, whether it seemed like maybe it was like a little bit flirty or a little bit whatever. And I just loved that he was like so himself you know like there was such beauty in the fact that he knew who he was he was unapologetic and that's you know I think I learned I I didn't learn how to do that because I'm not I'm very apologetic but I, I learned that that was a great trait and something that I could aspire to so mm -hmm. that's kind of what I learned from from playing him and did you um just in general too, did you take the dubbing easier or was it kind of difficult to get used to it? No, I actually, I actually found it quite easy to do. I, I think, um, you know, there's a, definitely a sense of uh, timing involved in dubbing because, you know, you hear the line in Japanese or in French or whatever other language that you're dubbing from. Um, I've done Norwegian and, ja you know, lots of Japanese, but um, there's timing. So you hear the line and you think, okay, I have to fit my thing into that particular whatever that is two and point four seconds and um having come from a musical theater background i felt like uh, because timing is such a huge part of comedy like right. anything you do that is funny has an element of timing to it um i even teach my kids that now um because they're like little comedians and um i just felt like um i i got that part of it and, you know, you, you know, obviously they had to teach you like, OK, you hear three beeps and then you pop in for the fourth one and do the line. But once once I figured it out, it really came quite naturally, actually. Yeah, I can just say now that uh, being being a gay man that uh, early on, um, it really, Abaratsubo was one of the main 
characters or just uh, like outlets in general that really helped me be comfortable in that when I was a lot younger and um, coming to like realize that it's that that's okay and your performance as him was just uh, amazing to me. So oh, thank you. For, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. That is so sweet. <laughs> I actually just watched this thing last night. Do you watch Shit's Creek? Oh yeah. Yeah. I just watched like the making of the end of Shit's Creek. Uh, they did a making of documentary of the sixth season, the final season. And they talked about how impactful it was on the LGBTQ plus community uh, as a show. And uh, so to hear you say that, I'm, I'm very flattered. Thank you so much. Right. I just tried to make, I just tried to make him um, so comfortable in his own skin, you know, that he could just say anything. So the fact that that was, in any way impactful to you i i really appreciate it thank you yeah yeah and i actually have um it's a production sketch from one of the oh my god that's so cool where'd you get that um i've been in the i've been in the like animation cell hobby for a long time so okay i guess have a lot of uh connections i guess <laughs> oh yeah do you draw yourself at all um i did like when i was younger but i kind of just mostly focus on other people's art now yeah. that's cool i can't draw a goddamn thing not even a stick figure it's pretty pitiful so after uh after magic Uters club uh do you remember what your second more major role was? um i don't remember what the next thing was because i did so much work for michael in those days it was like my early 20s and i just i was in almost everything that nyab post was 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 dubbing Okay. Um, so like, you know, if, if you talk to the, they have this office manager named Clark, uh, and he knows everything that I've ever done. And I'm just like amazed. He's like, oh yeah, you know, you know him, you worked with him in this thing. And I was like, I didn't work with him. I mean, he, they were in it and I was in it, but you know, you're in the booth by yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't work with anybody except the director and the engineer. Um, so the next thing I remember doing which was not necessarily the next thing I did, but the next thing I remember doing was this really small part in Ah oh My Goddess. Have you ever seen Ah oh My Goddess? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I played Senbei, the little like genie, yeah. who was like, Shaquin, you know, that guy that uh, a lot of people really liked him too. So I remember doing him. Although that was like a, it was a tiny role. I think he was like a couple of episodes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I remember doing that. But you've probably done research, so you could probably tell me what I did <laughs> better than I could. Well, yeah, because I was going to say, uh, if you remember being in things like uh, Zeo Rhymer. I do. Yeah, Hades Project. Yeah. yeah. Um, was that Professor Go? Is that that one? That was Giant Robo. Oh, Giant Robo. Okay. Yeah, I remember doing those two. I remember Professor Go was really fun. Um, he was cool. Uh, he was like a lot of really intense stuff. A lot of like, we have to do this before you die. You know? Um yeah, it's funny uh, bringing all this back. It's like been so long um, <laughs> since I've done these things. <laughs> I feel old. Or what the Twin Signal? Oh, Twin Signal, I remember, because I used a lot of that. I used some of Twin Signal for um, my reel when I put together yeah. like an animation reel, which is on like on my website. And when I wanted to get an agent, I sent that around. And I remember that one. That one was like, that was an intense one too, because he did a lot of screaming. Um, and that was one of the first ones where I was really like, wow, this is, this is tough work. I mean, if you're in there for a couple hours and you're really yelling, like that's, you know, that takes, that takes a special amount of resilience right. uh, that I also found I had, but uh, also it's, it's, you know, it's tiring. I know uh, this is a more like over the top comedic one, but uh, pizza and Gal Gygar. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, <laughs> totally, yeah, um, I don't remember a ton about that one, um, I remember we, we, I mean, we did a lot of the first ones at a studio uh, in near the World Trade Center, I remember that was where NYAV was at the time, it was down on like John Street, um, if you've ever been in New York, it's like right around the corner from the World Trade Center, and then, you know, he had to shut down his whole studio because of the attacks, right, um, and he was working at a couple places, uh, like a friend's place on 11th street or tw no 21st street. And then we moved to his, the current office, which is on 25th street and did a lot of that stuff there. And is there a, 
well, with, with, with like how long you've been uh, working with Mike, everybody else that I've talked to has like a particular story or highlight about him. <laughs> um, Michael is a genius. Michael is, um, I mean, he, if I know anything about this work and I don't claim to, but I, you know, I've done a lot of it um, at this point. Um, if I know anything, it's because he taught me. Uh, I now direct for him sometimes, you know, like I directed uh, Talos Nana and Machia, if you saw that film, um, I did the dub for that. And well, I co-directed that, excuse me. And, um, you know, so I've learned from him both as an actor, as a director. Uh, I wish I'd learned as an engineer. I don't engineer it myself yet. He's just on another level. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, everything that I see and hear when I'm looking at, at, at picture and I'm listening to a performance, he will hear three layers more than that. He's just unbelievable. You know, I, I had him, uh, he was around for one of the Talentless Nana sessions and he was just like making me think of all this stuff that I didn't think of. And he's, he just makes me feel like he's otherworldly mm -hmm. in, in terms of this kind of work. And that's why his dubs are so good mm -hmm. as opposed to other things, you know. And on the on the topic of Micaiah, since you also played a crim in that, um, were you... Like, or was somebody else directing you or were you kind of directing yourself? No, I kind of directed myself. Um, although, um, so Mike Schneider, who worked for NYAV for a long time as an engineer and then did some directing, he and I kind of co-directed that because of um, just schedule conflicts because I have so much audiobook work that I can't necessarily give all my time to directing something as much as I'd like to. So uh, he was there for it, uh, but I don't, I don't recall him doing a ton of um, directing of me uh, other than just cheering me on, you know, like cheerleadering, you know, <laughs> um, but he and I got along really, really well. We always did. And um, so that, that was fun. And again, that was a short, it was a short, a small role. So it was short in, in the scope of that film, you know, where we worked on her stuff for, you know, weeks on end and my stuff was, you know, maybe like two sessions. Mm -hmm. um, because he shows up in the beginning and then he shows up toward the end. And I remember I wanted to do a, an outtake, a singing outtake like I always do. And we just never got to do it. But when he's like surrounded by the fire at the end, I wanted yeah. to do the ring. I wanted to do Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire, <laughs> which would have been fun, but I didn't get a chance. But that was a, that was a great project. I loved that film and I loved how it turned out. It was just was really good. And so I think it would have been a little bit later on, but your role as a Rao and Kai in the Gundam series? Gundam was really cool. Mike Schneider was engineering me on most of those sessions. Carrie Kiernan was directing them, which was awesome to work with her because we'd known each other from Berserk, but only like tangentially, like I said, like maybe mm -hmm. like passing, like she's coming out of the booth and I'm going in the booth or you know, Michael Sinter Nicholas is like, oh, by the way, this is this is Casca. And I was like, oh, my God, that's Casca. That's so cool. Um, so getting to work with her as a director, and it was one of the first times that um, that I did that. But I, I remember some of that series as being really intense and really cool. There was one session where I swear I screamed the whole time that the big, you know, finale of, of Rao um, where he was just like, I am what you made me. I mean, I don't remember any lines from anyone practically, but I remember that line. Mm -hmm. And I remember Mike Schneider was like, mm, that was so good. <laughs> and I, I peaked, I actually like clipped on the mic. So like I, it was too loud for the mic, but he fixed it because he's a genius. So I didn't have to do it again because it wouldn't have been as good anyway. Because it, I just like, I tapped into this, like this primal rage of this mm -hmm. guy who was just like, dude, you know, I am just, no, you, you did this and not me. So, you know, playing bad guys has been a part of what I've done my whole career. If you can even call him a bad guy, I don't know. He's just a guy who has different ideas, but um, yeah, those, those were really fun. And then getting to play his, like, you know, his not, you know, spoiler alert, his like clone, mm -hmm. who's actually a good guy. Yeah. You know, it, it, it uh, that was really fun too, uh, although that was a much smaller part as well. Um, but uh, Gundam, being part of Gundam just feels really cool because Gundam is just cool. Right. You know, it's like being part of Star Wars in any way, you know, which I haven't really been yet. But it's like if you get to be in that universe, that's pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
And um, I can kind of probably guess, but what is the single darkest headspace you've had to get into for anime? It was Berserk. It was the when we did the movies. So we did Berserk, and then 10 years later, they did that trilogy of films that were reanimated. Right. And they got most of the same cast together with Michael directing, um, which was such a good move for them and, and such a cool thing for us to be able to do. Because as an artist, um, as an actor and an artist, you grow every time you do something. You know, you learn, you grow. And to be able to attack the same role 10 years later with 10 years more experience and you know, I mean, I'm sure a lot of your listeners and watchers will know this, but like when you walk into a session for an anime, I don't know the story. Mm -hmm. Nobody's told me anything. You know, they, they, that's just not how it works in this industry. You, you literally go line by line and they, they explain to you, the director explains to you what is going on and why you're saying what you're saying and what the subtext is and all that stuff. And that's why a great director like Sintra Nicholas is so vital in this field because you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. But to go back and do Berserk again, knowing the arc, knowing where Griffith was going, knowing where the relationship between him and, and Guts was going, knowing where everything was leading to was totally different. So to answer your question about the darkest headspace was probably that scene, you know, where he's, he's got his tongue cut out yeah. and he's been tortured and he's in the dungeon. And it was like, literally, it was a whole session. I think it was two hours where I didn't speak a single word. Oh. It was just so in order to it, to get into that dark, deep place, uh, that was that's very memorable to me of, of having to do that. And that was just like I was so drained after that. Um, I just felt like I had been tortured. Mm. Um, so, you know, that was really cool. But getting to do those films was awesome. Um, it was really it was such a gift. And when the first. Uh... TV series came about. Was that also just a normal audition? That was, um, so Michael came to me, uh, Citra Nicholas came to me and he said, I have this role. It's really good. And I think you would do it beautifully. He, he oh. came to me, he knew though. So, so I auditioned, he didn't give me the role. I auditioned because obviously probably Japan had to decide. Um, but he coached me through the audition and he loved the, um, he's always said he likes the, kind of nobility that my voice has like I, I have this kind of um this air of it also worked for Krim in Machia because yeah. he was like an eternal you know he was like he had the, we tried to get all of those uh, immortals to have a little bit of a sound like that was slightly different than a regular human um so so yeah he came to me he said I've got this thing you really want to do it and I was like, okay, you know, I already trusted him. I'd already worked with him for a couple of years. I trusted him and uh, I auditioned and I didn't have any idea what a big deal it was at all. Cause I'm not in this world really. I mean, I just work in the world. I don't, I don't, I don't watch a ton of anime on my own and I don't read manga and I didn't really know how big a deal Berserk was period. You know, obviously I figured it out as time went on, <laughs> you know, as the years went by and, if anybody knows me for anything in this world, it's it's really it's for reserve pretty much. I mean, this is I have I have, I have an action figure. Oh yeah, <laughs> that Michael Cinder Nicholas bought me when I went to a convention with him last uh, two years ago. Yeah, and I have a, a little keychain that is on my Christmas tree downstairs. Oh, <laughs> little Griffith keychain. So that was how that came about, and I remember distinct moments of recording that show first the show um and then the movies um i i remember it was summer i remember it was hot i remember i uh was like shedding layers you know as i went on because we would do like it was a it was kind of a rush job and we did maybe like five hour sessions which was a yeah. lot it was a lot. And, and, you know, and I remember, I can distinctly remember, hold, I had a wooden sword, like a sparring sword mm -hmm. that I brought in just like as a prop because I wanted to like feel like I had a sword on me. And I, I don't know, I guess I'm like, you know, method in that way. Uh, but it really helped me, especially when he's like on horseback and he's like commanding the armies and I would hold out the sword and be like, ah, let's go this. 
And um, I, I just, I, I have distinct memories of that for sure. And how tiring that was. And um, Sinter Nicholas and I just working into the late hours because that's, you know, how he rolls. He like never sleeps. And then I remember the reaction to it, which was so huge and everybody loving it and loving the dub and um, watching the show. Because I, I haven't watched it. I haven't watched a lot of my stuff, but I did watch that one uh, because I saw how people were reacting to it. And I wanted to know, I wanted to know how to capture that magic in a bottle, both as a, as an actor and as a director mm -hmm. in the future, because I've always wanted to direct. So I wanted to know how Michael did that. And the answer is because he's a genius, but, um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I remember about mm -hmm. the first Berserk. And then the second Berserk, I just remember going into it feeling like the first time I was a kid and the second time I was a man, you know, <laughs> yeah. feeling like the first time I was like fumbling about in the dark, like, oh, this is who this guy is. Oh, he's a demon. Oh, okay. Spoiler alert. Um, but uh, then um, the second time it was just like, oh, I totally know how to do this. And I had been training with acting teachers for years and I felt like so much better. I was so much better able to really go there. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, I think I maybe was, I don't know, like pushing myself a little bit instead of letting myself go there, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's kind of what I recall about that. And then just, you know, I'll be on a film set and uh, like here and there throughout my whole life ever since then. And people will just be like, oh, yeah, just watch this, this berserk thing. Have you seen it? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen it. And then I tell them who, who I played and they can't believe it. You know, they just, they're so shocked. And that doesn't happen about any of my TV work or my audiobook work or anything. It's like, it's, Berserk has been that special moment in, in my career, you know, where it was just like, everything came together. It was a perfect project, perfect team. And um, it just all really worked. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so grateful to have been a part of it both times. I wish we could have done that second season, but we tried. We tried. We really tried. But um, whoever was in charge went with some other group of people. And yeah. I, I didn't watch the second season, but I've heard people were disappointed. But mm -hmm. that's how it goes. On and, to the next one. <laughs> yeah. Well, and with how, um, you know, with how evil his character ends up becoming a could you personally relate to anything about him well like i said i play a lot of bad guys and the the key to playing a bad guy is you can't be bad mm -hmm. the key to playing a bad guy is you you have an idea of the world that might be different from almost everybody else's but your idea is still valid and your idea is the best idea that you can come up with and that's that's your that you have a plan Usually, you know, they usually have a grand plan. You have a plan and, you know, it's just tweaking things. So you, you derive pleasure from other things than, than other people do. You, your sense of humor, you find different things funny than other people. But, you know, I've, I'm an Aquarius and I've been, you know, misunderstood my whole life from, you know, people always used to think I was arrogant when I was shy. Oh. And... Uh, you know, I just, I can, I can sort of attach myself to any character because I can see where they're coming from. And mm -hmm. if you can see where they're coming from, not that you like believe that or anything, but if you see, if you can see where they're coming from and why, like the Gundam guy, like Rao, if you, you see that all he wants is, to, or like um, Thanos, you know, you, if you're going to play Thanos, you gotta, you gotta understand where he's coming from, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't know if you're a Marvel guy, but I am. I love the Marvel movies. Um, so it's just about twisting your perspective and, and finding a way to understand. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that, I think that's helped me in all my roles, uh, good, bad, or ugly. And, um, and I think it's helped me as a person, too. Mm -hmm. um, to sort of be able to put myself in other people's shoes um, a little bit easier. 
so it's been a gift. And do you have a personal opinion on um, if he really like the well? Like, I mean, it's sort of a joke, I guess, but the whole like he did nothing wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, he did nothing wrong. Yeah, uh, he did a lot of things wrong. <laughs> he did. He made a lot of choices I, Kevin, would not have made. Mm-hmm. Um, but I am an extremely, um, I fancy myself anyway, I fancy myself an extremely kind person, like friendly and kind. And, you know, that's just not, people are always like, oh, you're, you're not like those guys at all. And my mother always jokes that like, I always, when I'm on TV, I'm always playing like a drug addict or, a you know, somebody in rehab or a thief or something and it's just because of how I look but she's like but you're so nice Kevin and I'm like yes I know mom I'm so nice but um no so I I I, I wouldn't I wouldn't make the choices that he made mm-hmm. uh in terms of his friends his friends you know uh, it's it's kind of hard for him to use that word but I think he did what he thought was right mm-hmm. and it's like if you can if you can sort of understand that then you can buy into it uh, as an actor. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's not like in real life where I'm like, oh, I don't like what that person did at all. You know, but um, it it's it's a trick. <laughs> it's something you learn. It's something you learn. And like I said, I've had a lot of practice. I know there's been. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's been a lot of um, like analytical. Uh, kind of take away from how the whole gay subtext of him and Guts's relationship, especially early on, do you think that he was, that he's in love with them or was, or? I th- well, I don't know. I, I think, yeah, I remember the, like the, the well scene where they're splashing each other with water and they're naked and yeah, uh, yeah they, they definitely have something. I think yeah. they have something. But Griffith was so driven, you know, to get where he wants to be that he doesn't care about anybody and he's willing to step on anybody and do anything to get where he believes he should be. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's hard to say he was in love with Guts, um, but he certainly could have been. Yeah, (laughs) could have been. I don't know. You know, I'm not, I'm not the guy I played the guy, but I'm not, I'm not the guy. Um, I, I think um, there was something special about their relationship in terms of every other relationship he had throughout the whole show and the movies. Um, there was something special about that bond. Right. So say what you will about it, but there was something there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just, just uh, generally too, are you, have you read much of the manga like later on no i I actually haven't um i uh i'm kind of waiting for my my son is 10 and i'm waiting for him to get a little bit older before he delves into anything that that's that deep or that bloody um but um i think that might be a good opportunity for me to look into some manga is is with him Mm -hmm. because he loves graphic novels and uh, he's really into that i just want to wait until he's a little bit older until i um, dive into anything that um, grown up. Okay. You know? It was really cool, um, obviously, to see you, Carrie, and Mark do the video, like the tribute video. Yeah, yeah that was nice. I felt I, I felt bad. I meant to say something personal like they did, and I, I never did, but I, I should say that, like, he, you know, he, his work changed my life. It really mm-hmm. did. It changed my life for the better. So that's not nothing. Right. Yeah. And uh, this is more of a funnier question related to it, but um, sure. obviously, obviously the original dub is known for the outtakes. Is there <laughs> yeah. like a standout one to you, like that you did? Um, I always remember, I mean, I remember a couple. I remember I'm just a girl who can't say no. I remember mm-hmm. um, uh, a lot of the non-musical ones, but a lot of the musical ones stand out. Like, uh, if you liked it, then you should have put a ring on it uh Camelot you know there was just you know like I said we were in there for five hours and like we were like you know it was so intense 
that like Michael and I, we had to occasionally just be like, I'm going to do this now. It, and it hit, it resonated and people loved it. And it was great. And I, I tried to do outtakes now in every project I do because people love them. You know, they just love seeing behind the curtain, you know, mm-hmm. and, and seeing, oh, these are real people. And, and not only are they real people, but they're actually like fun people. And they have um, goofy ideas that we can get into. And they twist these wonderful stories that we have, these little moments, they twist them into something else and make it funny. And um, I just remember, yeah, I remember doing the first song. And then after that, Michael was just like, you got to do a song this time. You know, every time we did a DVD, he would, you know, because we did them in, in batches. There's what, like four or five episodes per yeah per DVD. And um, every time he was like, we got to do a song. What are we going to do? And so we were always on the lookout. And now, like I said, even with Maki, I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll do a song and I'll like bring that back. And um, so uh, the, the outtakes were just a way for us to to blow off a little steam and to have a little fun and to just shake off how intense these things are, because most of them are super duper intense. They're usually like end of the world, like people dying, turning into demons, you know, like it's it's and and there's two ways to deal with that, right? You can just like not buy into it or as an actor, you can really go there. And if you really go there, you know, occasionally you want to make a fart joke now and then. Yeah. (laughs) You know, (laughs) so, or sing a song because I'm a singer, you know, I've been a singer since I was six years old. I started doing musical theater when I was six and um, I just wanted to do that. And at the time, nobody was paying me to sing songs. Mm -hmm. So I just did it because I was just like, yeah, fuck it. I'm going to do it. And I did it and people loved it. So, you know, I'm so happy that that's great. You know, I, I still write songs and um, I have a new batch of songs coming out, but I think last year or the year before I came out with an EP, like you can look me up on Spotify and, you know, I, I love writing songs about beginnings and endings are like my big things. I love writing like the beginning of a relationship or the end of a relationship. Those are the two moments that I feel are just so ripe with, um possibility for mm-hmm. exploration so yeah I'd like not to like be a shameless plug but like go look at my music <laughs> well just uh the other day i was listening to uh crossing to safety oh cool that was my first wow well, it seems like a lot of those songs are really uh personal very personal that a lot of those were about the end of my like first love relationship you know like when you're in high school and you fall in love and they she crushes your heart or he crushes your heart and um that a lot of those songs are about about that um and i try to you know and sometimes i'll read a song that's just a story and mm-hmm. it's just you know, it's not it's not real um, but now if i write a love song you know it's often about my wife or about the start of my relationship with her or or whatever and luckily that hasn't ended knock on wood uh so i haven't written anything about our relationship ending but um yeah crossing to safety i was i was 19 years old when we did that it was over a summer um after my freshman year at nyu and i just said hey i got these songs and i want to record them and this guy who i'd worked with in high school had a recording studio and so we did it and it's it's very bare bones we didn't finish a lot of it um so it's not like my favorite thing to go back and listen to because i wanted to go back and do a lot more backup vocals and a lot more layering of things which i do now now i'll do like three four or five part harmony because i just love throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks but um it was a it was a really good i mean every time you're in the studio making music it's like for me i could be there for 16 hours and not get tired Mm-hmm. whereas whereas if i'm recording an audiobook or something like after two hours i'm like Woo, i'm exhausted yeah but making music for me like if i could do anything like all day every day i'd probably be making music okay i love making music well uh, yeah i think uh my personal favorite track from that album was uh empty empty yeah thank you yeah <laughs> that's really cool thank you for listening to that i appreciate that yeah yeah, so my next thing is going to be, a, a, I'm not sure if it's going to be a full album or a, an, another EP um, called Beginnings. That's all okay. just about, it's just the starts, the starts of things. And like a couple songs about like my kids, um, 
and stuff like that. So it should be fun. I think I'm going to work with this guy in New York that I've been working with on a different project. And I think it'll be really fun. All right. Cool. So uh, going to uh, film and TV, I was uh, wondering what the cases where you've been the most starstruck in terms of who you've, who you've worked with. Most starstruck. Well, speaking about in the music world, I was in this weird play one time that um, it was just such a bizarre show. It was like a series of skits, really. It wasn't even a play. But the guy who directed it, whose name was Andrew Schaefer, uh, who's also a brilliant dude, um, comedically, he happened to be friends with Adam Duritz, the lead singer of Counting Crows. Oh, yeah. And so Adam Duritz came to the show and then we had dinner afterwards. So like that was the most starstruck for me because that's always been like my favorite band. Mm -hmm. And so like to be able to talk to the guy who wrote some of my favorite songs ever, yeah. uh, I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. But, um, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate in film and TV. I've worked with a lot of like really big names. I mean, I, and when I say I've worked with them, like I was there for like, uh, like two hours and mm -hmm. did like one line. I didn't, I, I did I haven't done like, major stuff but like I did a scene with Adrian Brody and I did a scene with Nicole Kidman and I did a scene where Jason Bateman was directing me and I've done scenes directed by Ang Lee and um you know have I ever been starstruck yeah but actually I was I was kind of starstruck at my sister-in-law's uh wedding which was recently because Ben Platt was there uh from oh. Dear Evan Hansen. Yeah. So I was kind of starstruck by him just because I find him just like astronomically talented. Um, so there's that. But most of the time, these people are just people, right. you know, and you get talking with Nicole Kidman and she's like a super nice lady and she's got kids the same age as my kids. And it's like very easy to be like, oh, kids, they won't take a nap. Right. And, you know, you just find out that everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time and everybody mm -hmm. poops and pees and you know, we're all just humans. So have I been starstruck? Yeah, but also I felt like, I felt like I belonged, you mm -hmm. know, hanging out with those people. So it was totally cool. You know, I, I did a great scene with Scorsese on the, the pilot of Vinyl, yep. uh, the TV show on HBO. And it was me and Ray Romano were in this really short scene that didn't even have any scripted dialogue. So we literally, he got us together. Scorsese got us together and he goes, well, let's figure this out. <laughs> the three of us. And I was like, really? You're Martin Scorsese. You're, you're asking me to help you figure it out. Like I'm like Joe Schmo and he's Ray Romano. He's famous and you're famous. And we figured it out together. The three of us, mm -hmm. how we were going to do the scene, what we were going to say. And then, you know, we were, we had to snort some Coke, some like fake Coke. And, um, I felt so empowered by him, which I think is one of his true gifts, Martin Scorsese's gifts, is I felt empowered to speak up. And I said to him, I was like, hey, um, Marty, and I felt so weird saying the word Marty. Hey, Marty, um, has anyone ever snorted Coke off a moving record? Like a spinning record? And he was like, no, not that I can recall, because I knew if anyone had on film, he would know. I mean, he's like, I mean, in real life, yeah, probably, but in, in film? I don't think so. And uh, we went on and we were talking about something else. And then uh, we got back to the subject of how we were going to do the Coke. And Ray Romano was like, so what, are we going to do it off the moving record? And Martin Scorsese looked at me and looked at him and he goes, yeah, I think so. And we did. That's how we did it. And it was, it was my idea, which I feel like so blessed and, and honored that he, that he even thought my opinion was valid. Mm -hmm. And there was a there was an article in um, I don't know if it was Variety it might have been Variety when the show came out and it premiered and they said the five best Scorsese moments of the whole pilot and that was listed as one of them mm -hmm. snorting coke off a moving record which was not even his idea but you know what I think that's the greatness of him is he's a collaborator. Yeah. And, you know, like Sintra Nicholas, he wouldn't say like everything was his idea. He would be like, what do you got? What do you got? Bring that to the table mm -hmm. because two heads are better than one and three heads are better than two and all that stuff. So um, that was, that was a cool moment. I don't know how I got off on that tangent, but okay. that's a fun story to tell. Yeah. What about with, uh, when you got to work with Gina Davis? 
that was cool. So we did this pilot. Um, it never got a title. I think it was called Exit 19 or Untitled, uh, where she played a cop and I played this kind of like skeezy dude. I, at the time, I was clean shaven mm-hmm. and she remembered me. So um, she was super nice, by the way. She was like the first Oscar winner that I ever worked with. Um, and the second I got on on set, she was she came over to me. And she's like, hi, I'm Gina. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, I know, I know who you are. But she's so cool that she's just like, I, I'm a regular person. She's mm-hmm. just a regular person, which I loved about her. And she grabs me and she, she writes on my face in Sharpie or fake Sharpie. And she's like, oh, I know you because you had a mustache and that was the scene. And then my character gets killed. Um, So they see my body. But the thing I remember about that show, other than Gina Davis being so cool and actually drawing on herself a mustache at the end of this this the shoot and taking a picture with me, which I have in my phone. um, She was super cool. But also the producer said and maybe they were blowing smoke up my ass. I don't know. But they loved me so much. They were like how long do we have to wait before we can bring Kevin back as a different character and people won't notice? And I was like, no time at all. (laughs) Bring me back. But the show didn't get picked up. So, so they could have done that with me Mm -hmm. (laughs) anyway. So yeah, working with her was very cool. She was awesome. It was just a day, but it was, it was really fun. Roy to NY if you post to have you worked with Stephanie Shea much? With Steph, yeah. Uh, so Steph and I have worked mostly at, when I was directing things. Yeah. So she would, uh, she kind of eased me into the directing track there, um, and I don't think she's ever directed me, and I don't think I've ever directed her, which is weird. But we've worked together in terms of like she's Michael's like right hand right. woman, and uh, and so anytime. Um, there's any talk about anything like the tone of something or like she's also so gifted in terms of how a, how a thing should read and the tone of things. And um, so that that's what I know about Steph is she's just like super efficient, really good at her job. She's a great director, great um, engineer too now. Uh, and um, she's just super cool. I just like her a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She was close on one of the roles in Machia. I can't can't remember if it was Machia or the other one, but she was very close to getting that. She's also a very great, she's a great actress too. Right, yeah. She's just like talented. Has there been any other um, like major anime series where you came close to getting a big part in? Where I came close? I don't know because I'm never part of that conversation. So the only times I knew about casting were when I was involved in Machia's casting. Um, because usually it's, it's Michael and Steph and, Mm -hmm. um, and Japan or, you know, whoever's, whoever's in charge of the product. Um, they are the ones who ultimately decide. And usually we will give them, you know, our top three or top four, you know, depending on what they ask for, they might ask for five. Um, but uh ultimately it's not up to us you Mm -hmm. know we can say hey i like this guy or this girl or whatever but you know they could pick somebody else i i I did um i directed a video game for nyav called earth defense force iron rain it's part of the edf series which is like giant bugs attack the earth and you have to shoot them with guns um so i directed uh that video game for them uh and they that was a um Japanese company yeah I think it was a Japanese company and they picked the voices uh the guy who picked the voices didn't even speak English oh wow so he was picking the voices purely based on the timbre of the voice how it sounded he couldn't understand any of the English that they were Mm -hmm. saying in the auditions uh, which I thought was incredible (laughs) because he actually cast really well yeah really well like like the characters were so great on that one I worked with a lot of people that I hadn't worked with before um, and uh, it was it was a fun one. If you ever like to shoot bugs, go check it out. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to ask in terms of um, audiobooks as well, since is that what you primarily sure. do now? Yeah, well, um, I, yeah, I guess primarily is a good word. I do it every day, pretty much. I mean, I, my mornings are basically spent narrating audiobooks, and this is my booth behind me. Okay. who I've named John Wilkes. It's John Wilkes Booth. Um, and um, 
so I go in there for like two, three hours every day, pretty much. And I, I'm up to like 430 books. And um, it's been amazing for my family and for my career because I haven't had a day job in, in well, 15 years uh, because of this. Uh, and I, haven't, I haven't had to worry about health insurance because of this. Mm -hmm. So um, while it's actually one of the hardest things I've ever done, because it's acting in a vacuum, right. at least when you're doing an anime, there's a director there, sometimes a director and an engineer. So if you do something funny, they might laugh. Or if you do something um, intense that really reads, they might go, ooh, that was good. But if you're doing an audiobook, there's nobody there. Mm -hmm. It's just you. And it's all output. So it's all energy output without anything coming back. Unless I go out and read reviews about my books, which first of all happens months later. And second of all, they're all bad reviews anyway. So I don't read them. But because um, only people who are mad write reviews, I guess. But um, it's, it's pure storytelling at its mm -hmm. purest form. You know, So it's like everything I do is storytelling, whether I'm writing a song, whether I'm doing an anime, whether I'm directing something or whether I'm in a book, it's all storytelling. It's all about that sitting around the campfire, you know, as humans and telling a story. And this is just the purest form of storytelling. And the only thing I can say about it is um, it just, you know, it really depends on what you're reading. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're reading great stuff and sometimes it's not so great. So either way, you have to give it 100%, and either way, you're not getting anything back. So it's very hard work. It's very uh, taxing, both vocally and, um, like, energetically. Mm -hmm. But it's been awesome. And I, like I said, I have a booth in my house just so I can do that and sometimes some anime. But um, it's um, it sure beats working for a living. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say that. It sure beats waiting tables or uh, working in an office, which are all things I did mm -hmm. uh, when I was struggling as an actor and only making money doing anime here and there and waiting for my ship to come in. And this it really has been my ship. Mm -hmm. So I, I drink to it. And has there been a standout case where um, with with audiobooks with how many characters you've had to play or something like that where it was like yeah I did a I did a trilogy uh, years ago for audible um, it was a Jack Vance fantasy trilogy that had 400 characters in it so like that was the last time I counted yeah and now I, I don't even bother uh, counting um, uh, but that that was intense I mean that was like you know and they were all pretty much British I mean I remember doing a I did an Isaac Asimov book called The Currents of Space early in my career. And there were five upper class British men talking to each other. Mm -hmm. So same accent. And they were all elderly, same age, same gender. How are you supposed to make five different guys distinct? And that's when I discovered um, pitch, right? Pace. So some were fast, some were slow. Um, I slurred one because he was drunk all the time. Uh, the other one, I think I just made him a jerk. He was just like mean, <laughs> you know, just like everything was very pointed. And so, you know, um, difficult for me is, is Australian. I can't do an Australian accent for some reason. Uh, uh -huh. Like when people give me a book and it has an Australian character in it, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> but they usually don't ask. Um, and so I've, I've been getting a little bit better as the years go on, but it's just an accent that I struggle with. Um, but other than that, uh, I love uh, characters. They're just fun. You know, they just break it up. So it's not just me talking all the time. It's like, oh, I get to be this guy for now. And then, oh, it's like, you know, it's, it's jumping into different perspectives so quickly. Right. Uh, because it's like literally the next line. And all of a sudden, oh, all of a sudden I'm a 10 year old girl or I'm this or I'm that. And it's also being able to play characters that you'd never play on film and TV. Mm hmm like women, for instance, although I did play a woman in a show in college uh, in the Three Penny Opera, I did play Jenny Diver, um, but that doesn't happen that often. Um, and it's just, um, it can be a treat mm -hmm. to read something that's really great. 
And, uh, you know, I've read things that have brought me to tears and I've been in the booth and just, you know, I just start weeping. They're just so beautiful. And I've done things that have affected my life and that I, I'm glad to like tell people, oh, go read this book. It's beautiful. So, yeah, like I said, I've been very lucky, very mm-hmm. lucky. And on the on the case of um, altering your voice, it does seem like uh, Griffith and Abarazzo were kind of just more affected versions of your normal voice. Well, Abarazzo, yeah, Abarazzo was like a lot lighter, right? So he was just, you know, hmm. um, and Griffith was a, just a little heightened, like a little not heightened pitch wise, but a little erudite. Mm-hmm. because of the the nobility that he was that Michael was going for he wanted him to be a little lordly you know if that's even a word he wanted him to be a little set apart mm-hmm. from everyone else who was like a normal voice especially like guts this is like gritty and I'm guts um, and they wanted him to just rise above the way that he thought he would in life you know so it's it's always fun to be able to do something like that and um, like the Gundam stuff and to be able to just play and find mm-hmm. a guy who's so complex and so interesting and so messed up and um, to get to find out how that sounds in your voice. But I, you know, like uh, Michael Sinter Nicholas has this great screensaver on his computers, which I'm sure he wouldn't mind me telling. And, and it says choices are greater than like that greater than symbol greater than voices so when he when he works with you he wants you to come in with acting choices not with like oh i'm gonna do this voice and then you're gonna make it sound like this it's much more important that you have a reason for saying something the way you're saying it than just that you have the ability to make weird voices you know mm-hmm. so i've always loved that screensaver and so it's like it's like right behind the video every time they like change episodes and so it always is a great reminder to be like no this is about this is about i mean obviously you have to do voices sometimes but it's about truth mm-hmm. you know it's about telling the truth the character's truth and that is always the goal uh in in anything is truth Mm -hmm. yeah so is there anything else uh upcoming that you can talk about um let's see i've auditioned for some stuff lately but nothing that i've booked um i i'm just doing a lot of books right now the books have been great especially during the pandemic it's been you know i haven't really slowed down at all Mm -hmm. so i I knock on wood and i thank god for that because um you know my kids got to eat and we got to have health insurance so we can go to the doctor. So, um, yeah, it's been a lot of books and uh, some directing. I really loved doing Talentless Nana. That was a great project. I hope they'll do a second season of that because I know there were more manga and it would just be so fascinating to find out, you know, where they all go. Mm-hmm. Um But other than that, I'm just kind of working on my music and, uh, you know, being with my family, getting ready for the holidays. Okay. Yeah. And my final question is always asking, what do you want your legacy to be? What do I want my legacy to be? Well, it's going to sound pert and, and kind of cheesy, but um, I don't care as much about my work as I do about my life. And so my answer is kindness. I'd okay. like my legacy to be kindness, acceptance and kindness. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's what I strive for every day. And that's what I, that's what I tell my kids. So I have a six-year-old and a 10-year-old and I've told them so many times, I'm sure they could recite it, but, um, I, I don't care how successful they are. I don't care who they end up with, boy, girl, you know, goat, whatever. Uh, I, I don't, I just care that they're kind. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what matters to me. And I don't know why that is, but um, that's, I guess, how I'm wired. And has there been, with all the conventions you've done or fan interactions, has there been uh, like a single pilot story where uh, your role as Griffith especially like changed someone, like helped them in some way? Or 
Yeah, I've had people say that to me. Uh, I've actually only been to one convention, believe it or not. I, oh. I came at that very, very late. It was actually um, 2000, I want to say 17. It was like right before the pandemic, I went down to like Virginia to um, NECOCON, NECOCON. I, don't, I actually don't know how to pronounce it. I'm so sorry for everyone who's from there who are watching. But I did one convention and I thought that Berserk being as big a deal as it was, that that I would still resonate with a lot of people. But actually, you know, when I did my signings, they, they were mostly empty. They were, it was kind of funny, mostly nobody showed up. But I've definitely had people come to me and, and at, that con at that convention and uh, through email or through my website, who've come to me and just said that, um, like you said with Aburatsubo, that, uh, that I somehow gave them permission to be them. Mm -hmm. And there was no greater compliment you could give me truly than that. Um, so I thank them and I thank you. Um, and, you know, obviously thank you. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, I'll be sure to uh, send it to you once I have it up. Yeah, that's great. And I'd like to see your other ones. I'd like to see um, Michelle Marie's and, you know, your other ones. I know you had some, you've had some big people, right? Yeah, well, aside from voice actors, yeah, I've had uh, like Leah Thompson and Rosanna Arquette. And... That's so cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> How did you get in touch with them? Leah was way more involved, but um, uh, Rosanna, I just emailed her manager. So oh. it's easier than some people think, I guess. <laughs> cool. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. I love Leah Thompson, man. I love them both, but that's cool. Was she mm -hmm. nice? Yeah, she was. Oh, and and um, she's originally from Minnesota as well. So. Oh. Cool. Talked a lot about that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, I love what you're doing. That's so nice. Thank you. you oh, made my day. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I've, yeah. Been a, I've been a big fan, obviously, since I was like, I don't know, 12. So <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel old too. All right. Great. Well, it's been lovely talking with you. Thanks to you as well. All right. See ya. See ya.